Thank you, John. So, I just have to wait till the guy waves at me in the thing. Okay. <laughs> so, mind the muddle. What I'm going to be talking about this afternoon is some of the muddles and philosophical debates that are around at the moment about what is mind and how solution-focused practice can help us to mind the muddle, stay clear, stay simple, stay at the surface, and stay useful to our clients. So think about what we mean by mind for a moment. Some people think of mind as something that happens magically in here, like a computer, the magic, amazing brain that is the mind. Right? That's one view of mind. Another view of mind is that mind is about interacting things, interacting elements, and this picture is a picture of Trafalgar Square, an amazing mix of interactions. And that's a much more Gregory Batesonian view of mind. And of course, in this conference, we know that Gregory Bateson was a precursor of solution-focused practice and the interactional view. And of course, that's going to be a rather interesting definition of mind for us to explore. So let's have a think about the two basic pictures of what mind is. The cognitive picture and the enactive picture. In the cognitive picture, mind creates representations of the world in our heads. We look at a bottle and our mind magically creates a representation of a bottle and it's the representation that we work with, we act on, we interact with and so forth. And you can see on the screen here, uh, the mind, this guy's brain and mind are creating all sorts of representations of amazing things. It's all going on in here. That's the kind of view that's been around for so long, we almost think it's true. <laughs> but there's an, this other view, the inactive view, that has been gaining momentum over the last few years. It's quite current. This. The inactive view says, no, that's a misguided thinking about what goes on. As we, 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 we don't create a representation of the mind, of the, uh, a representation of the world in our minds, we explore the world. The world is its own representation. We don't need to create the bottle in here. It's out here already and we can learn about it. And you can see how this might work. If you imagine you're a blind person, for example, it's quite clear how this might work. You find the bottle by touching it and feeling it and, and sensing it in that way. Um, it's less clear what happens if we don't think about blind people, we think about sighted people. But uh, the bottom two pictures here are taken from Kevin O'Regan's uh, recent book, Why Red Doesn't Sound Like a Bell. And he's exploring this sensory motor view of cognition, uh, which he says that we learn about the world, it's out there, and we learn about it by exploring it with our bodies and muscles and so forth. So you see on one side what the person he calls Squidge Man, discovering the sponge by squidging it. Uh, and on the other side, there's Eyeball Guy, who's looking at a picture of a, a, a triangle, and he's examining it by moving, almost imperceptibly, his eyes, his body, and so forth, to literally get to grips with uh, the picture of the triangle. And the same could be true of a bottle. We learn, we see a bottle, we move our eyeballs, we move our bodies. And this explains why we don't have a sense of seeing half a bottle on the table. We're quite confident that the bottle continues round the back, even though we can't see it, because we're actually exploring it by moving around. So, in this picture then, uh, the bottle is out here. There is no bottle in here, no representation of a bottle in here. Um, the, the, uh, what there is in here is, is chemistry and electricity and brain and stuff going on. Uh, I'm going to come back to that later. Now, question. What do we think about memory? How does memory work in this inactive picture? Is it not just recalling some data like off a hard disk, which is rather the image in the, in the cognitive picture? No, it's not. Uh, remembering, the clue is in the word. Remember. We remember things, and remember is like putting something back together. It's the opposite of dismember. And in English, dismember means kind of pull the legs off. <laughs> yeah, so some of the, the men in the audience anyway may have dismembered flies when, you were, when we were young. You know, you pull the legs off and see what happens. 
That's dismembering. Remembering is putting back together. And so in the inactive Wittgensteinian view, memory is an active process of putting something, an experience perhaps, back together. Uh, and so it's not just recalling information from somewhere deep in your mind. It's an active process. Each memory is created again. Um, and we can, uh, we know, for example, that what we can remember and how we can remember it is different depending on where we are, who we're with, uh, even things like what, you know, what smells are around. You've had this experience of walking into your old school and you notice the smell. And the smell suddenly brings back all these memories. You know? This is very much us remembering things, remembering as a whole person, a whole embodied person. Um, and likewise, you, you go to somewhere you haven't been for ages, you arrive there, you look around, and suddenly everything becomes clear and what was where and the experiences that we had uh, and, and what happened last time we were in that place all comes clear when we arrive. So, memory as an active process. Now, let's just think then about how the cognitive and inactive pictures play out when we want to think about mental illness. I've got a couple of statements here off on the conventional psychological websites trying to define what mental illness might mean. And I'm going to read this uh, off the screen because I want to get the words right here. So the top one says, mental illness is a mental disorder, uh, a psychological pattern or anomaly, potentially reflected in behaviour that is generally associated with distress or disability and which is not considered part of normal development of a person's culture. So something unusual. The second definition from the British Association of Behavioural and Cognitive uh, Psychology. During times of mental distress, people think differently about themselves and what happens to them. Thoughts can become extreme and unhelpful. This can worsen how a person feels. They may then behave in a way that prolongs their distress. They may then behave. So it's, both of these are saying that something, the thinking happens first and then somehow that's reflected in behaviour. So the magic mind happens in here, like the puppet master, and then the behaviour comes afterwards. And the inactive pro uh, paradigm challenges that view. It's not thinking, then behaviour. Thinking and behaviour are all the same thing. And indeed, exploring the world is thinking and cognising. So we don't want to have something inside that appears on the outside. We want another view. And here it is. This is one inactive view, anyway, from uh, Professor Thomas Fuchs of the University of Heidelberg, who collaborates with us at the University of Hertfordshire. He says, he works with schizophrenic people, and he says, we should not say that the patient is ill. Rather, we should say that the world of the patient is ill. That's a really significant thing. It's not the patient is ill, it's the world of the patient. And remember, this is an inactive view. So the world of the patient is not in here, as some people would have you believe. The world of the patient is out here, and guess what? It's the same world that you and I are in as well, when we're with the patient. Yeah? We're part of that world. So it's about working with the world than the person's engagement with the world, not with whatever might be happening uh, in terms of mental process anyway, in here. And of course, Fuchs is echoing our friend Ludwig Wittgenstein uh, in this famous statement from the Tractatus. Uh, the world of the happy man is different from the world of the unhappy man. So the man's happiness changes and his world changes as well. And uh, this is a kind of slightly uh, mysterious statement from Wittgenstein. But we're now finding you know, quite good scientific and philosophical thinking that, that backs him up on this point. Now, we've talked about mind a bit, but what about the brain in all this? And here's a picture of the brain looking a bit sad at having been left out of the talk <laughs> so far. What are we going to say about the brain? What does the brain do? Is the brain the mind? Does the brain create the mind? How does it work? Well, to get a handle on this, we can turn to Professor Rome Harre and his vision of hybrid psychology. Hybrid psychology, the psychology for the third millennium, as he slightly underestimatingly calls it. Um, it's a very exciting idea. It's very coherent with what we do in solution-focused practice. He starts from this fantastic initial statement. There's nothing in the universe except molecules and meaning. 
And that's just a, that blows me away, the simplicity of that. And yet, I think he's right. Molecules and meanings. And they're different. They're different sorts of things. Molecules just are. And they move around and they interact according to physics and chemistry and all of those things. Um, and meanings, on the other hand, are socially constructed between people in public in the course of conversation, interaction, culture, and everything else. Um, and that gives you two ways into looking at an issue like mine. The trouble with these things, and, and where people, I think, have been confused in the past, is that you mistake the one for the other. And my favourite example of this is the idea of the stop sign. Uh, where is the stoppiness of the stop sign? The stoppiness of what is in it. We, if we did an experiment, we could take a, make a stop sign that looked coherent with the local culture, the German stop sign. I'm sure that's a very efficient stop sign, by the way, the German <laughs> stop sign. Uh, we could make a stop sign, we could take it outside this theatre, put it in the street, and we could observe then, scientifically sit there with white coats on and clipboards, and observe cars stopping and looking around and then moving on again. Now, I predict this is what would be happening. And then we'd say, now, nah, now, what is it in the sign that is making the car stop? Mm. And we'd take the sign off to the laboratory, and we'd cut it open, and we would examine it with microscopes and spectroscopy and, you know, Pantone colour charts and, and the whole thing, and x-rays, neutron scattering, to try and find out what it is in the sign that makes the car stop. And, of course, that's the wrong question, obviously. But it doesn't. Tragically, stop scientists wanting to go off and do this with every single thing they come across. <laughs> Try and unpick the molecules because that's where the correct answer must be. For molecule questions, the answer is in the molecules. For meaning questions, and of course the stoppiness of the stop sign is a meaning question. It's drivers learn to stop at stop signs, and they learn it's very important to stop at stop signs, and they learn it's better to stop at the stop sign and be cautious than say, oh, that's just, that's Mark and his crazy made-up stop sign, I'll just ignore that. You know, um, so uh, it's a meaning thing, and to find how meaning things work, we have to look at how the meaning is constructed. And the meaning is constructed in everyday life, in everyday conversations. In this case, in driving lessons and stuff like that, and practice, and the police enforcing it, and everything else, and stopping at stop signs is also, by the way, culturally different in different countries. Some countries have more stop signs than others. In the United States, they have a lot of these four-way stops, and people know how to negotiate those. In the UK, there's relatively few stop signs anymore, uh, and, uh, and people are a bit confused about whether you really actually have to stop or not. So, <laughs> it's true. People are confused. You, most people actually don't stop at a stop sign. They drive very slowly, and then they go again. Yeah? That's the British way of stopping at a stop sign. It's stopping. It's not stopping at a stop sign. In the United States, you get a ticket if your wheels don't actually stop, for I think it's one second or something like that. Anyway, molecules and meanings don't get confused because this is what leads to the, uh, what Rome Harry calls the task and tool metaphor about the brain. So what does, role does the brain play in thinking? And he brilliantly uses an analogy here, the task and tool metaphor. So the analogy is with digging and a spade. When somebody digs a ditch, they use a spade to dig the ditch. Okay, you got that? Got the picture? <laughs> we use the spade to dig a ditch. Now, is the spade digging the ditch? No. The person is digging the ditch using the spade. And some spades are probably better for ditch digging than others. Uh, and there might be other various reasons to dig the ditch in the first place. <laughs> now, if we go to the picture of the brain, and the same thing is true. The person is thinking. Now, you see the lady on the picture thinking about something there. The person thinks, and they use the brain to think, just as they dig the ditch and they use the spade to dig the ditch. The brain does not think, ladies and gentlemen. The person thinks, using their brain. And I am the first to admit that if we removed somebody's brain, their thinking would be very, very limited. <laughs> and uh, probably rather, rather short as well. Um, so I'm not saying that you know, people don't think 
using their brains. Of course they do. Um, but the brain itself does not think. The brain, on its own, does not no more think than the spade digs the ditch lying on the ground without the person to do it. Um, and so if we, want to st- and if, if we want to study spades, we can study spades. And if we want to study digging, we have to go and watch people digging. And it's just the same with brains. We can study brains, and we should, and that's kind of molecule stuff, probably. And if we want to study thinking, then that's people stuff, and that's meaning, and therefore we have to go and watch people actually thinking and doing things and, and seeing what counts as thinking, and so forth. And we're avoiding what is called the myriological fallacy here. And it's a good Latin word for the day, myriological fallacy, um, which is ascribing to a part of something, a quality that should really only be described to the whole of something. So, brains don't think, people think. And this is from the wonderful book, Philosophical Foundations of Neuroscience by Bennett and Hacker. So, what are we doing then when we sit down for a coaching session, a therapy session, a talking cure session? What are we doing? Well, if we have the cognitive picture... We know that all we're getting out front is kind of the results of whatever the mind is doing. And so all the behaviour that we're seeing in our clients, we have to kind of think, oh, this is a a reflection of what's going on in their brain. So I have to kind of watch them very carefully to interpret, not just what they're showing me, but what's going on behind the scenes. Yeah? We have to, that's where we get to diagnosis, we get to understanding, we get to helping people understand their thinking processes. We get to listening to them, as if we're trying to study them. It's a kind of a very sort of third-person way of listening this. I'm listening to you to try and understand what's going on deep somewhere behind the scenes. That's the cognitive picture. But if we take the inactive picture seriously, what we do is we stay at the surface, we talk to them about their lives, probably as they would rather have them, and we, in constructing descriptions of better futures, times in the past when things like that have happened, what might be uh, signs of a small next step, getting to N plus 1 on the scale, for example. What we're doing is helping them engage with the world in a new way. They are negotiating a new way of being in the world, and that's why it's so important for us to stick with their language. Their language is is what we have to work with. And it's it's playing that language back, having them enlarge on it, accepting it, what Steve Duchesne used to call radical acceptance, such a key part of solution-focused practice, that helps us to do that without reinterpreting for them their lives, experiences, and so forth. Um, So we're taking their experience as the primary thing, and we're working with it. We're not taking their experience of a sign of something that we have to interpret. So, just to sum up then, if we did that, might it work? If we got people to describe better futures and times in the past and signs that getting better, might it work? Well, we're here at a solution focused conference and I think that's exactly what we do. And we know the research and all the backup that there is now and growing. And Dr. Alistair MacDonald. Uh, estimates there are 1,500 papers a year coming out, many of them not in English or German, but in Chinese and Korean. And from all around the world, people are now researching solution-focused practice, Um, but we're not putting that data together well enough. So, these are some of the questions that we're all familiar with in a solution-focused way of working. What might be a tiny sign in the next few days that things are getting better? What difference would that make to you? What difference would that make to other people? What's helped you to do that in the past? And this is working in the world, not in the head. But, of course, you and your client both need your heads to do it. So the head's in there, but it's playing its rightful part as we talk about engaging with the world. So, in closing, I'd just like to remind you to mind the muddle. Be sure to say, am I thinking, at, looking at my client as if I'm trying to guess what's going on in their mind behind the scenes? Or is the mind out here, we're using it every moment that we describe, engage, create meaning together, and generally get on with our lives? 
Thank you very much indeed.